I know, I know, I know, I owe you an explanation. We're gonna get to that. But first, let's talk about this Abloy pick and my friend Hux who made it for me. So you can be pretty sure that like when Abloy executives go talk to their therapist, Huxley picks the guy they're talking to him about. So he calls this the silver bullet. It's a universal disk detainer pick, but certainly geared towards Abloy locks. The engraving on the uh, picking spindle corresponds to the disc position, while the engraving on the while tensioning spindle corresponds to the disc number. On the disc manipulation tip, you can see just how thin that metal has to be in order to slip between the discs. Anyhow, the R&D and just creative mind that went into making this tool and to attacking alloys really uh, represents years of Hux's work and. Um, I feel really lucky to have one of his picks. Alright, alright, I can hear you guys screaming at your screens from here. Shut up and pick the lock already, tumble 3R. Well, I'm going to pick the lock, but I have no intention of stopping my yammering. I'm apparently one of those guys who likes to hear himself talk. Before I get too far down this road, I should probably give a shout out to my friend Ken Nixon who loaned me this Abloy Classic padlock. I knew I had the pick coming and um, he was kind enough to loan this to me. Even though all the discs are lined up at the zero position after you pull the key out, uh, getting the picking head in is actually can actually be a little bit tricky because of the alignment of the, uh, the spindles to the keyway. I'm probably really more worried about it than I need to be, but the picking tip is so thin, uh, I just am paranoid about damaging it. Obviously, the Abloy Classic is tensioned from the back. I believe there was a previous version uh, a long time ago that was tensioned from the front, but there was a picking attack that worked against it, so they changed it. Abloy's strategy with kind of all their locks is really to put enough stuff in your way down the keyway that you can't get tools in there. So the first order of business is to start kind of down at the bottom of the stack and work my way up getting everything into a gate. Once that happens, everything bites a little bit harder and the lock is much easier to read. Conceptually, picking these is just like any other lock that employs gates. You're just positioning the discs into gates uh, and testing to see if they're true or false by jiggling them. If the disc jiggles freely, yeah, you know you're on the right track, and if it grinds, you know you're not. Now I'm having to do quite a bit of counter-rotating on the tension in order to get myself out of false gates. Uh, for some reason, that is much more acute going clockwise than it is counterclockwise, and I'm not sure why that is. but. Again, I'm trying to be very careful with that picking tip, not to put too much pressure on it and damage it. I do find that I need to work my way up and down the stack more times than I'm used to. Um, discs that seem very free early on the process will bind later, so just revisiting them over and over again is kind of the ticket. So I guess it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. Because seriously, an elephant in the room? I mean. Well, I guess technically it's an elephant in the garage. So I dusted all the cobwebs off my YouTube channel and looked at the last time I made a video. Turns out it was almost exactly a year ago. And in that year, a lot of you have reached out to me asking why in the heck I haven't been making any videos. And most of the time I just say something like, well, my interests are elsewhere, or I haven't been feeling like it, or something like that. But the truth is, it's a little more complicated. I mean, that's certainly part of the story, but it's not the whole thing. Believe it or not, YouTube is not my first internet publishing rodeo. I used to run a blog a long time ago, and I'd write technical articles, mostly for things I did at work. Anyway, I ran ads on those articles, and eventually came to depend on the money it generated. That translated into enormous pressure to publish content. Even content I didn't want to publish or particularly think was valuable. So when I decided to create this channel, I thought both about what I wanted it to be and what I didn't want it to be. Mostly what I wanted it to be was a channel that picks hard and interesting locks and pushes me to challenge myself. What I didn't want it to be was one of those YouTube channels that pumps out daily content that's easy to produce and really of dubious value. So really the reason I haven't been creating content is that I haven't had anything that I both had the energy to create and thought was worth sharing. I mean, I've got a job. I don't need the money. And frankly, I don't like the fact that Google or YouTube incentivizes quantity over quality. So this is me not participating. It's just me inviting you into my garage to share my hobby. That's really all I want it to be and all I've ever really wanted it to be. So I might not make videos every day or every week or even every month, but when I have something interesting to share or an interesting lock to pick that I've actually managed to figure out how to pick, I'll share it with you. 
and I'll try to do it in a way that's as interesting, fun, and entertaining as I can. So I don't want you to become a patron on Patreon. I mean, I don't even have Patreon. And I don't want you to have to watch ads. Just sit back and give me some moral support and send some good thoughts that I might actually be able to open this stupid lock sometime this month. So what's going on with the lock right now is I'm continuing to drop into different false gates and work my way up and down the stack, testing the other disks to see if they respond differently. If they are in a false gate, they may have jiggled freely a while ago, but as I move the other disks into true gates, they would become uh, kind of grindy or, or perhaps stiffly bound, you might say. In a similar way to when you're first putting the pick into the lock, the picking tip can sometimes not want to move past the different discs depending on the angle of the pick relative to the keyway of the lock. So it's the same kind of problem where you'll be trying to move to a different disc and no matter how much you spin the barrel around you can't necessarily get it past. So that means just changing the angle of the, the pick itself tends to usually work that problem out. but it's often not immediately clear exactly what uh, what the problem is. I mean, you'll kind of return to the position that you kind of knew that the previous disc was in because, you know, it's easy enough to keep that in your mind and the, the pick, picking tip won't want to slide past it. So that's generally an indication that your angle is off. I find that as I'm making progress and getting more and more discs into true gates, I actually have to ramp up on the tension in order to detect the grindiness of some of the other discs, and I'm not sure if that's something that's just specific to this lock or if it's a, it's kind of a generality with, with Ablay Classics, but it becomes less clear um, with light tension um, if a disc is binding once you're closer to opening the lock. So that's what's happening right now. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have most things in true gates and uh, what I'm doing is just visiting all the discs and really cranking down on the tension for each one to to see if it grinds. And again you can see that when I'm rotating the disc counterclockwise out of false gates I really don't have to back off so much on the tension but when I'm moving them clockwise I, I almost have to counter rotate oh I don't know five or six degrees uh, in order to get them out. Otherwise it feels like I'm just putting an awful lot of tension or pressure on that picking tip. Now all the discs for further back are, are really consistent in there and their loose jiggliness. You can kind of hear them tap on the sidebar when you, uh, when you jiggle them back and forth. So that's a pretty good indication that you're in a true gate. Uh, these, these last few uh, near the, the front of the lock, I suppose you could call those the the lower numbered positions, they tend to be varying a little bit depending on what I do. And we got the lock open. Cool. Alright, let's see if we can keep it in frame while we take it apart. When I was just first getting started with this lock, I was ridiculously paranoid about getting the pick out. Um, for some reason, I just had these nightmares in my mind of, of the picking tip getting stuck behind two discs and I couldn't figure out how to get it out. I've become a little bit more comfortable with it over time. And, um, once the, the picking tip's out, the tensioning tip is pretty, pretty rugged, so you can just kind of um, quickly thrash all discs back to zero position and then pull it out.
one thing I always thought was pretty cool about Apple locks is they've designed the key so that it can be used as a tool to take out the plug retainer. That was kind of a clever design choice. I've been dreadfully inconsistent on how I've been able to take this lock apart. Sometimes the entire assembly slides out cleanly and other times it's like this where the, the discs come out of the, the little lock sleeve. Anyhow, here's the sidebar. It's a, really just a round piece of stock. See if I can get the disc retaining sleeve out of there without dropping anything. There's still a the tensioning disc is still in there. Here's the groove cut into the lock body for the sidebar. I always try to make sure I maintain the orientation of the discs because they actually serve uh, two positions. If you flip them around the other way, they're, they're an opposite position disc. Of course, I'm not doing very well on that front right now. This is the sleeve that holds the disc pack, and you can see the little cutout there for the sidebar. I'll see if I can get these discs off this key and hopefully keep everything in order. In between each disc is a little copper spacer. Uh, they're all the same, but they're kind of interesting. I'll try to show a little bit of detail in each disc before I set them down. You can kind of make out the false and true gates that way. Of course, later we'll come in for a good close-up. This is probably not the best pinning tray to use for this. So maybe I could have turned it over. Anyway, I was just kind of excited to use it. Uh, I made it recently on my milling machine, and I always kind of wanted a brass pinning board. And I thought a lot about what I wanted, and designed it in CAD and then knocked it out, so I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I'll probably make a separate video just for that at some point. You kind of start to realize just how many discs are in these things. I mean, it's crazy how many rows of discs I'm going to end up with by the time I get this thing apart. You can see the little protrusion or handles maybe that come off of each disc. Those interface with the disc retaining sleeve, the larger gap, uh, and that controls the extent to which each one can rotate. And finally, the last disc. All right, let's come in for a close-up and get a good look at all the little parts. Hopefully you can make out the true and false gates on the discs. And then also the spacers, you can see that they're shaped in such a way that they would only fit in uh, to the disc retaining sleeve one way. Uh, and that prevents them from getting in the way of the sidebar. Anyway, I guess that about wraps it up for the Abloy Classic. I want to thank uh, Ken Nixon again for loaning me the lock, and uh, Huxley Pig for making me this beautiful, beautiful disc detainer pick. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching. <laughs>